A big shout out goes to Ground News for sponsoring this video. Check them out at ground.news forward slash droid. The link is in the description below. During the early days of the Cold War, the US needed bombers that would be capable of flying from the US mainland all the way to the Soviet Union quickly and avoiding enemy air defenses by flying higher than the Soviet fighters or missiles could reach. Two bombers emerged that would represent almost opposite ends of the spectrum in getting the job done. At one end was the B-52 Stratofortress, a huge eight-engine super heavy bomber that could trace its routes back to World War II bombers like the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-29 Super Fortress. Then at the other end was the B-58 Hustler, a supersonic bomber that came out of the high-speed research to break the sound barrier by Britain and the US just after the war. A plane so advanced that it still holds many of the speed records it set over 60 years ago and was as fast as almost any modern bombers and fighters of today. This was the tortoise and the hare of SAC, the Strategic Air Command, and we all know how that story ended. The B-58 got a bit of a bad rap and faded away, whilst the B-52 will nearly be a hundred years old by the time they finally pull it from service in 2050. It's already the longest serving aircraft of any type, be that military or commercial. And yet, of those who flew the B-58, it was a much better suited plane to do the job of penetrating Soviet air defences before ballistic missiles remove the need for any type of nuclear bomber. But missiles would take until the 1970s to perfect, so from the 1950s on there would be a need to be able to deliver a nuclear payload both quickly and accurately over longer ranges than ever before and be able to slip past enemy air defences untouched. The B-52 was the heavyweight option. It might have been slow-ish and more vulnerable to attack, but with its huge carrying capacity, it could hold enough fuel and nuclear weapons to fly near the borders of the Soviet Union 24-7, 365 days of the year in Operation Chrome Dome from 1961 to 68. Here they remained on continuous airborne alert, flying routes that put them in positions to attack targets in the Soviet Union, if so ordered and should nuclear bases in the US be destroyed by a Soviet first strike. The other alternative was to use a fast attack aircraft, one that could sneak in and outrun any fighters that the Soviet may have. Just four years after World War II ended, and only two years after the sound barrier was broken by Chuck Yeager, plans were already underway to create what would become the world's first supersonic bomber, the Convair B-58 Hustler, an aircraft that would leapfrog the competition and something that still looks the part today. Technology had changed at an astonishing rate over five years or so of World War II, and supersonic aircraft became a reality when Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in the rocket-powered X-1 in October 1947. Just two years later, in 1949, the generalised bomber study was issued by the Air Research and Development Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for the development of a supersonic long-range manned aircraft. Multiple contractors submitted bids, including Curtis, Douglas, Boeing, Convair, North American Aviation and Martin, but two designs stood out from Boeing and Convair. The Boeing was a supersonic version of the existing B-47, whilst the Convair looked like it was straight out of the sci-fi books. This had a two-piece delta wing, but itself would be a parasite bomber carried by a Convair B-36 Peacemaker closer to the target and then dropped to continue the mission, before splitting in two. One part would be the nuclear payload, and the other would be a smaller return aircraft for the crew. This idea was considered overly complex and too high risk, so Convair combined it into a single aircraft and underwent numerous changes in the design before the slender four-engine delta wing design was chosen. Back in the time of the B-58 in the 1960s, things seemed a lot easier to know what was going on. But today it's become increasingly difficult to try and keep track of the news and which agenda news outlets are trying to spin, whether they be right, centre or left-leaning. But how do you know what sort of bias news organisations have? Well, this is where Ground News comes in. Ground News is an app and website developed by former NASA engineer Harleen Kaur in 2018 
Ground News takes news articles from over 50,000 sources around the world and then pulls them together in one place. But it also shows who the sources are, their political leaning, who owns them, where they are based, and their factuality based on reporting practices. To give you an example, here's a report on the Baltimore Bridge disaster and what led to the massive container ship hitting the bridge. On the right, you can see the coverage details, the number of sources, and how recent the updates are. Then the political bias of those sources, left, center, or right-leaning. Here they are mostly center-biased. Below this is the factuality score, which is quite high at about 66%, and who owns the source? Here, they are mostly media conglomerates. Just click on any of the sources to see the article, or you can look to the left of the page to skim the headlines of the articles to see how each source is framing the news and go to the news articles from there. You can also search for the subject of an article you're looking for, be that for current news events, people, politics, basically any type of subject, and build them into your own following feed or just browse the news for what interests you in particular. To find out more and access data-driven information from around the world, go to ground.news forward slash droid, the link is in the description below. And if you subscribe through my link, then you can get 40% off of unlimited access or try it for less than $1 this month. The B-58 Hustler was designed just a few years after the B-52. Both would be carriers of nuclear weapons and key parts of SAC, or the Strategic Air Command. And yet the two could not have been any more different, like comparing a race car to a truck. The B-52 was, and still is after 70 years in service, a very large subsonic aircraft, crewed by a crew of five, and had a wingspan of 54.6 metres, eight engines, and a maximum bomb load of 32,000 kilograms, which included the large internal bomb bay. The B-58 Hustler was a Mach 2 supersonic delta-wing aircraft with a pencil-thin fuselage for streamlining, carried a crew of three, had a wingspan of just 17.3 metres, four engines, and a maximum bomb load of 8,800 kilograms with no internal bomb bay. Because there was no room in the fuselage for the bomb bay, the B-58 would carry all the bombs and additional fuel tanks externally, including up to a 9 megaton device, which was fitted into a combined weapon and fuel tank pod. This droppable two-component pod beneath the fuselage contained the nuclear weapon along with extra fuel, reconnaissance equipment, or other specialized gear. The lower fuel section could be jettisoned while keeping the upper weapons section until the target was reached. The B-58 was later modified for additional hardpoints to allow conventional weapons to be carried, but this never happened, and up until its retirement in 1970 only ever carried nuclear weapons, and up to five at once. But carrying not only the biggest nuclear devices in the US arsenal and external fuel tanks under the belly of the planes was an accident waiting to happen. The most infamous incident that occurred with a B-58 was at Bunker Hill Air Force Base, Indiana now Grissom Air Force Base, in December 1964, when a full takeoff drill was in progress. Three B-58s were doing an alert drill which required a close formation takeoff with just an eight second gap between them. As the first aircraft throttled up to full power, the second was pulling onto the runway, and through a combination of jet wash from the first aircraft and an icy runway, the second B-58 was blown off the runway and hit several hard standing objects causing the landing gear to collapse and rupturing the fuel tank, which caught fire. The B-58s were fast response planes, ready to reach the Soviet Union at all times, and as such, they were kept fully loaded with weapons and fuel, all 53,000 litres of it, and up to five nuclear weapons. Two of the three men crew managed to escape, but the third, Air Force Captain Manuel Cervantes, ejected from a plane in an ejection capsule. Although he escaped the fire that engulfed the aircraft, it was too low for the parachute to open in time, and it crashed onto the tarmac, and Captain Cervantes died later. This was a live practice drill, and as such, the B-58s were carrying up to five live nuclear weapons, including a BA-53, nine megaton device. As this was a scheduled test, the bombs were not fully activated, but were exposed to the fire which burned for several hours, 
and some of the conventional explosives in the warheads continued to burn for up to 12 hours afterwards. But the B-58 was all about performance, and that was exceptional for the time. With a light fuel load and the 62,400 pounds of combined thrust from the four General Electric J-79 turbojet engines with afterburners, it could climb at a rate of 46,000 feet per minute, or 235 meters per second, and attain an almost vertical climb. Its construction was also very advanced for the time and made extensive use of aluminium honeycomb panels to make the structure of the aircraft very light at just 13.8% of the gross weight and the wing was considered to be extremely thin. The large area of the delta wing also had a low wing loading which proved to be very well suited to low altitude high speed flight, much more so than the B-52. Like the B-52, it was designed for high altitude operations with a flight ceiling of 63,400 feet or 19,300 meters, but that would come almost literally crashing back to earth when Francis Gary Powers was shot down in his U-2 spy plane over the Soviet Union on the 1st of May 1960 by a surface-to-air missile, something that the US thought the Soviets were not capable of doing. Now the high-flying bombers would be forced to fly in below the radar, sometimes just above treetop levels, and the B-58 started to show its true colours. In the almost continual training that the B-52 and the B-58 crews did, it was found that low-altitude turbulence created much more problems for the B-52 than the B-58. The radar cross-section, or the RCS of the B-52, was often said to be like that of a barn door and it was also slow moving at low altitudes. This meant that in relative terms it had to keep lower than the B-58 which had a much smaller RCS. Low altitude turbulence caused problems with the long wingspan of a B-52 which would flex a lot, causing them to have to pull up to smoother air, but also exposing them to radar detection. The B-58 on the other hand had a small stiff delta wing but fared much better in low altitude turbulence and the very small RCS meant that it could often fly slightly higher at almost supersonic speeds and still not be detected by radar. The only time the radar tracking stations would know that the B-58 was there was when they flew over them and the sonic boom hit. The B-58 was packed with the most advanced electronic navigation equipment which allowed it to fly radio silent into enemy territory and the bombing accuracy was also better than the B-52. However, this was in the days of vacuum tube technology and it ran hot and needed air conditioning to keep cool. This made it unreliable and gave the B-58 a reputation that it kept until its retirement in 1970 as being an unreliable, expensive aircraft that was difficult to fly. By the mid-1960s, the vacuum tubes had been replaced by transistors and that part of the reliability had been fixed. But accidents did occur. The landing gear was not the best and with a large external fuel tank under the belly of a plane, a simple gear collapse could turn into a raging inferno in seconds. This wasn't helped by two B-58s crashing at the Paris Air Show, one while doing acrobatic manoeuvres, and the other by landing early and hitting runway lighting. It was also said to be much more expensive to run than the B-52, but what many people didn't know was that there are only two wings of B-58s, each with 39 aircraft, compared to the B-52 wings, which only had 15 aircraft. When comparing on a wing-to-wing -wing basis, the B-58 was more expensive, but it contained two and a half times as many aircraft. And when comparing it on a plane-to-plane -plane basis, it was very much more balanced. In a now declassified top secret report, the estimated annual operating costs of strategic bombers, including the cost for KC-135 tanker refueling support for both the B-52 and B-58 showed that the B-58 on a plane-to-plane -plane basis was less costly to operate. Being one of the first supersonic aircraft to go into service, crew safety when having to eject at Mach 2 was an issue and caused the death of at least one crew member and serious injury to the other two. So a self-contained ejection capsule was created. Each of the crew would sit in one of these if there was a loss in cabin pressure or an ejection was required, the crew member's legs would be pulled up and the clamshell doors would shut with an airtight seal, which would work up to 70,000 feet. 
The pilot had a stick control in the capsule which could continue to fly the aircraft if no ejection was required until they could reach a lower altitude. It could also land in the water and turn into a life raft if required. With the advanced electronics, star tracker, stable table navigation and downward firing Doppler radar for airspeed indication, the B-58 was thought more likely to evade air defences and reach for target than a B-52. But the Air Force top brass, including SAC top man General Curtis LeMay, disliked the aircraft from the beginning and after a flight in one declared that it was too small, far too expensive to maintain in combat readiness, and required an excessive number of aerial refuelings to complete a mission, an issue because it was never based in the UK or Europe, which would have been much closer to the targets. When the time came, the cards were stacked against the B-58, and even though the crews that flew the aircraft were convinced that it did the job very well, and better than any other aircraft of the time, Secretary McNamara ordered the retirement of a B-58 by 1970 on grounds of cost. By this time, ICBMs were also much more capable, accurate and unstoppable. The need for a supersonic nuclear bomber no longer made economic or strategic sense. The B-52 would carry on and become the mainstay in Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan, dropping every type of bomb except nuclear ones, something which doomed the B-58 elsewhere because it was a nuclear weapons platform and even after modification for non-nuclear, it never dropped a single weapon in a theatre of war. But things weren't all bad. The B-58 set 19 speed records, including the longest supersonic flight in history, when in 1963, a stock serving an operational unit called Grease Lightning flew from Tokyo to London via Alaska in 8 hours 35 minutes a journey of 8,028 miles or 12,920 kilometers, which still stands today. One of the primary goals of the flight was to test the aluminium honeycomb construction at a sustained Mach 2. Also the year before, in September 1962, a B-58 set the altitude record with a 5,000 kilogram payload at 26,017 meters or 85,357 feet. When the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird came into service, the only crews which the USAF had with high-altitude, long-duration supersonic experience were the XB-58 Hustler crews, and several crew members went on to fly the Blackbird at the beginning of the program. In hindsight, the B-58 Hustler was not as bad as people make out, and the worst parts of its performance were used as a reason to cancel the program because of political reasons within the Air Force and government, and these are still being reinforced today. If you want a more balanced view from someone who flew the B-58 for 10 years, check out the book by Colonel George Holt Jr., The B-58 Blunder, How the US Abandoned Its Best Strategic Bomber. Whatever you think, the B-58 is still one of the best looking Cold War aircraft, and on that, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I would like to thank all of our patrons for their ongoing support.